Okay, this is part three of the series of what really everybody needs to know. Part one was about heaven and hell, why there's a heaven, why there's a hell, how do you get to heaven. The second part was um, basically talking, well, now that you're saved, what do you do? Now that you're going to heaven. And so we concluded that by showing that you need to read and believe God's word. And so then this part three is going to be how to study your Bible. How do you understand it? And you can think of, basically when you look at the Bible, and this is where people get confused, is they think that the whole thing is written directly to them. Now, all the Bible is for you. You should read it all. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, um, to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works, you need to read and believe God's word. And the good works is you walking in the ones that Christ has for you. We talked about salvation from hell, and then you get to go to heaven, and your job in heaven is going to be to spread God's love throughout heavenly places for all eternity. And so you need to know how to do that. Just like if I want to be an accountant, I have to go to school to become an accountant and learn how to do it, and then I apply it in the real world. And that's what the Bible is, is uh, it's the, the theory or the basis behind God's love and how to spread it throughout the whole world. But um, you're going to be applying it. You can go ahead and apply it now, uh, the more you get in you in the inner man. Uh, but then you're going to be applying it for all eternity. And the more you know about God's love, the more sound doctrine you have in your inner man, the greater your responsibility, the higher your position in heavenly places. In heavenly places, the Bible says in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, that there are thrones, principalities, powers, mights, dominions, and every name that is named. So if all you did was have a deathbed repentance where you stop trusting in your own righteousness and trusted in God to save you through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, then God gives you the gift of eternal life, uh, and then you die, well then you'd be in every name that is named. But if you spend your life uh, studying God's Word, and as we talked about how the Holy Ghost teaches it to you as you read and believe it, well then you will have, um, you can build that sound doctrine in the inner man. Um, and then you can get a higher position in heavenly places. It's like the more schooling you get, the more a higher position you can get as a career. And uh, so the way it is, and we talked before about how when you're saved, that your spirit is made alive in Christ. Um, but, and then you're given the mind of Christ. You've got God's completed perfect word in the King James Bible. And then you've got the Holy Spirit to teach you those things as you read and believe it. And although your spirit is alive the moment you believe the gospel, you really don't have anything else built up in that inner man. You have the choice after you're saved to use the mind of Christ or to use fleshly wisdom. But you don't have sound doctrine in the inner man if you haven't read and believed your Bible, so you end up living by the flesh. So that's why it's important to read and believe God's Word. You can think of your spirit once you're saved, you're made alive in Christ, but your spirit is sort of like a blank slate. It's, um, you know, you don't have, you don't know how to, you got the mind of Christ, but you don't know how to use it because you don't have the doctrine to use it. You know, just like when you're born, you've got a mind, uh, it's fully capable of um, living in this life and learning things, but you got to go through and learn those things before you can actually apply the knowledge and get through life. So it's the same thing with God's Word. And that's why it says that all Scripture is profitable, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's God's completed Word that thoroughly furnishes you or equips you to make the decisions based upon that doctrine. Uh, so that's why the moment you believe the gospel, then the next thing God wants you to do, He doesn't just want you to continue to live in the flesh or however you are living. He wants you to live according to the principles found in His Word. And as you go through the Bible, you see that there are different principles. Although all the Bible is written for you, 
only a certain part of it is written to you. You got to understand that the Bible covers all of mankind's history. It starts in the beginning in Genesis 1 when God created the heaven and the earth. It ends, Ephesians 1.10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God is going to gather all together in one in Christ, both which all things which are in heaven and which are on earth. So he's going to, so you've got you start at the beginning when God created everything. You've got this, the rebellion of Satan and the rebellion of man. And you go through a period of at least 7,000 years because we've lived 6,000 years since God made Adam. And we've got another 1,000 year with the millennial reign coming in the future. So you've got at least a 7,000 year period that's covered by the Bible. And God has different instructions for different times. So you can think of the Bible and they, maybe this will help you understand it when you come to it you got to look at, well, where am I in this history? It's sort of like looking at the laws of, let's say, because these are God's laws, his rules there in the Bible. You can think of it sort of like, well, let's look at the rules of the United States, the laws that govern the United States. Uh, there are some laws that were passed when this country was established over 200 years ago that are still in operation today. There are some laws that do not apply today. I could go back to the books and say, well, here's a law that was on the books in the United States in the 1800s that says I can own a slave and that if a slave could vote and it's worth uh, three-fifths of a regular person's vote, you know, I could do something like that. And that is a law of the United States. But if I try to own a slave today, um, you know, I could get, I could get thrown in jail, you know, for enslaving somebody. That's not allowed today. Um, having a slave was allowed 180 years ago in the United States. Today, it's not allowed. And so, um, so when you look at the laws of the United States, you can't just look and say, oh, well, here's a law that was passed. Let's follow that one. You've got to look at it and say, okay, here's a law is it still in operation today? If it is, then I need to follow it. If not, then I shouldn't follow it. I could get in trouble, actually, for following a law that was that has been overturned and that it's not you know, applicable anymore. Homosexuality, that used to be against the law. You couldn't marry, homosexuals couldn't get married uh, in the United States. Now they can. Laws change over time, is my point. And when you look at God's word, you're not looking at a period of just 250 years or so. Uh, like you do with the United States, you're looking at a period of at least 7,000 years. And so when you look through it, you got to look and see what changes. Churchianity has their own rules, and what they do is they like to manipulate God's Word to fit their rules. And so they won't, um, they won't follow what God's Word says. They just follow their rules, and then they find a scripture to fit it. And so that's why they won't recognize the differences in the laws. They'll tell you, for example, that there's only one gospel in, in the Bible. You know, it's Jesus' death. That you, you trust in that and you have uh, forgiveness of sins. Or maybe they throw water baptism in or something. They just bring up one. They say there's only one gospel in the Bible. Well, there are tons of gospels in the Bible. Um, the gospel means good news or how you are saved. If... Adam, for example, in Genesis 2, his gospel was, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If he did not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would have eternal life in paradise with God. Um, that's not for me, uh, because there is no tree of knowledge of good and evil right now uh, on this earth. So, you know, if that was the gospel for today, well then, you know, I agree, it says, the Bible says, if I don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then I am saved. I have eternal life in paradise. That's what Genesis 2 tells you. Um, and so it's in the Bible, it's biblical, so I'm going to follow it. Well, if I did that, then it would say everybody has eternal life. Everybody goes to heaven. That's not, that was a rule for Adam. It's not for us today. Similarly, in Genesis chapter 6, God told Noah, build an ark. You build an ark, you're going to be saved. If you don't, you're going to perish. So I could say, well, it's Bible, it's biblical for me to build an ark. Well, today, no one's done it except the Creation Museum up in Kentucky. Other than that, um, you know, everybody else would be lost going to hell if that was the gospel for today. Genesis chapter 15, Abram, he is, he, God tells him, count the number of the stars. 
and uh, see if you're able to number them. So shall your seed be. And it says, he believed in the Lord and he counted it unto him for righteousness. So God gave Abraham eternal life when he believed that God would make Abram's seed as numerous as the stars in heaven. That's not to me today. Um, if I if I think God's going to make the seed, my seed as numerous as stars in heaven and I believe that, God's not going to give me righteousness. It was an instruction to Abram and it's not to us today. Just like the instruction that was written in the United States law 150 years ago or however long it was said that you could own a slave. But today I cannot do that. Or the law that said that uh, you are prohibited from um, purchasing alcohol but yet now you can there are laws that were on the books that have been changed as time goes on and that's what God does in his word all of God's word is profitable but you don't want to say well I'm gonna follow every word because you can't follow it all you have to recognize what instructions are written to you specifically and which ones are for your learning but not specifically to you for example the dietary laws it is impossible for you to follow every instruction in the Bible when it comes to dietary laws. Because in the garden, God told Adam that you can eat of any of the fruits and vegetables, basically, and herbs. You are not, uh, you can't eat any animals. So they were vegetarians. You get to Noah's day, and now they can eat animals. You get to Leviticus chapter 11, with uh, Israel and now they can't there are certain animals that are clean and certain ones that are not clean then you get to first uh, you get over there to Paul first Timothy chapter 4 and he says that uh, forbidding meats is not good because uh, every creature of God is good and not to be refused so all uh, animals are clean so you can see the differences there. You go from, if you're following dietary rules of Genesis 2, you're a vegetarian. If you follow Genesis 6, you can eat whatever you want, animal or plant. Then you get to Leviticus 11, you can eat some animals and some you can't. Then you get to 1 Timothy 4 and you can eat uh, any animal now. There are no unclean animals. So they're all biblical. But you have to recognize, if you've got conflicting instructions like that, how are you going to know what to do? And like I said before with part one, the most important thing you could ever learn is how do you have eternal life? How do you get to heaven? And, well, I could go to Romans 3, verse 28. Romans 3, 28 says that a man is justified by faith alone without the deeds of the law. So it says faith alone. Then I can go to James 2.24. James 2.24 says, you see then how that a man is not justified by faith alone, but also by works that a man is justified. So here I am in the New Testament, and Romans 3.28 in the New Testament says faith alone for justification. James 2.24 says faith plus works for justification. So which one is it? And I better get it right. If I get the dietary laws wrong, you know, maybe that's okay because I had good intention and it's not, you know, that big of a deal. But if what if I get it wrong about how I'm saved? Well, then <clears throat> I could think I'm going to heaven when I really go to hell. That's, that's you know, very bad consequences. So it's important that we understand what's written to us today and what's not. And the by the way, the Romans 3.28 passage is to us today, the James 2.24 is not. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense because James, I could see where, uh, you know, Genesis, that I don't need to build an ark, or I don't need to avoid the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or um, I, I don't need to uh, make sure my seed is going to be as numerous as the stars in heaven, because that's all way back there in Genesis, that's in time past, we don't live there now. But James, that's further on down in the Bible, it seems like I would take whatever the last instruction is, I would follow that. Why am I following Romans, which comes before James? Well, the reason is, again, you've got to understand that the Bible is, it's just like 
the United States history is that I've got to look at the law and see when it was enacted and if it's been replaced or not. Well, the thing about the Bible is it's a lot longer than 250 years, and it doesn't just cover the history and the present, but it also covers the future. It goes to the dispensation of the fullness of times when heaven and earth are gathered together in one in Christ. So I've got to see where do I fit in, since the Bible covers the entire history and future of mankind, I've got to figure out where I am in that timeline and follow the instructions that are written to me today. And so that is how we understand. So all of it is for us, but specific instructions that we need to follow today, we need to see which ones are written to us. And so the way we do that is 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I need to rightly divide the word of truth, meaning I divide it, I divide the section that is to me apart from the section that is not to me. And I make sure, while I can read it all and all of it's profitable, I make sure that the specific instructions that I follow are the ones that are written to me rather than the ones that are written for me. And when we do that, what we find now, we've already mentioned that um, Genesis is not written to us. We've already mentioned Leviticus is not written to us. Uh, we know that James was not written to us. So we know that we can't say, because most of churchianity is going to say, well, that's Old and New Testament. You don't follow the Old Testament, you follow the New Testament. But the problem with that is that, like I say, you still have contradictions in Scripture in your New Testament. So you say, okay, follow the New Testament. That's how you rightly divide the word of truth. That's to me today, and the Old Testament is for my learning. Well, how do I reconcile Romans 3.28 and James 2.24? Well, Romans 3.28 says you're justified by faith alone, and James 2.24 says you're justified by faith plus works, and they're both in the New Testament. Or how about over there in Matthew 6 in the Lord's Prayer? That uh, refers to forgiveness of sins as well. It says, if ye forgive men of their trespasses, then your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, then neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind-hearted, tender-hearted, uh, be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So Matthew chapter 6 says forgiveness is future. Ephesians 4 says I've already been forgiven. I can't follow both. I can't follow Matthew 6 and say I'm going to forgive people in order to be forgiven by my Heavenly Father. And at the same time say in Ephesians 4, well I'm going to forgive people because I've already been forgiven by my Heavenly Father. Uh, it's, it's one or the other. It can't be both. Matthew 7 starts out, judge not lest he be judged. That's a big verse that people like to throw into Christians' face, saying that, well, you, you can't judge me because the Bible says, judge not that ye be not judged. Well, I could turn over to 1 Corinthians 2.15, and it says, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. So I got one verse in the New Testament that says, I have no right to judge anybody, and whatever I judgment I use, that's going to be judged against me. That's what Matthew 7 says. But then... 1 Corinthians 2 says that I can judge all things. So which is it? Do I judge all things? Or can I not judge anything? Or I'm going to be judged based on how I've judged people. But, but I can't already be judged if I've already received forgiveness of sins. Even if God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I can go to Acts 3, 19-21. And it tells me that what Peter was speaking is something that was spoken by all, the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. And that forgiveness of sins comes by repenting and uh, being water baptized. And then you receive forgiveness of sins at the coming of Christ. That's Acts 3, 19 through 21. Or I go to Romans 16, 25, and it says that 
Paul is given the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the beginning of the world, but now is made manifest. And I could go to Romans 5.11, which says, I now have the atonement. And Romans 5.9, which says, I am now justified by his blood. And Ephesians 2.5 and 6, which says, I am now seated together with Christ in heavenly places. So Acts says, I don't get forgiveness of sins until Jesus comes back. But Romans says, I've got it right now. And Ephesians tells me, not only do I have forgiveness of sins, but I'm seated together with Christ in heavenly places right now. So which one is it? If I say the right division, when 2 Timothy 2.15 says I need to rightly divide the word of truth, if I say that rightly dividing the word of truth means dividing the Old from the New Testament, it can't be that. Because I've got verses in the New Testament to contradict each other. So, there's got to be a different way. And, and the way you do it, the way you rightly divide the word of truth, I'll give you the answer, is that this portion of scripture written to you today is Romans through Philemon. That's Paul's epistles. And the rest of the scripture is not written to you today. So the only part written to you is Romans through Philemon. Those are instructions that you should follow today. And all the rest of the Bible is for you, for your prophet, but you are to not follow those instructions because they're not to you. The book of Luke, chapter 12, says, sell that ye have and give alms. Say, sell everything you have and give it away. And people say, oh, well, I didn't mean that. It just means if you feel led to do it. No, he commanded them, sell that ye have. And if you don't believe that's what he commanded, then you're calling God a liar. And also you've got proof because at the end of Acts chapter 2 and at the Acts, uh, end of Acts chapter 4, they sold all that they had and they had all things in common. So the people in Acts 2 and the people in Acts 4 obey the commandment of Luke 12 to sell that ye have and give alms. They sold all their possessions and they gave it away. But yet we don't do that today. Well, Paul didn't tell us to sell that ye have. He said in 1 Timothy 5.8, that uh, if you do not take care of your household, you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. So if I've got a wife and two kids, and I say, oh, the Bible tells me sell that you have and give alms, so I'm gonna sell all my possessions and give it away. And the Bible also tells me, uh, go preach the gospel to the whole world. And so I don't have time to work at a job. I can't take care of my family. I gotta go preach the gospel. And I can't give them anything. I can't say, well, here's a house and here's a car and here's an allowance and I'm going to go preach the gospel because I sold it all and gave it away. So I don't have any material possessions. So there's, it's, and I don't have a job because I went to go preach the gospel. And yet Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, 8, that if I do that, then I've denied the faith and I'm worse than an infidel. So which is it? Did I obey Jesus Christ or I disobey him? Well, I disobeyed him. Why? Because Paul's scripture is written to us today, whereas the other scripture is written for our learning, but it's not specifically to us. So how do I know that? Okay, I think I'll stop here. And in part four, we're going to cover the timeline of the entire Bible so that you can see why it is that we are to follow Paul today rather than... Uh, what Jesus said in the red letters. Thanks for watching.